Welcome back to the Dallas Prospect. I'm DDP, and today we are talking Mavericks Clippers 3. This is the not rubber match. That wouldn't be correct because the Clippers did win the first two. But this is the delayed redemption for the Mavericks in my mind. A chance to undo the wrongs of maybe not 2020, but certainly 2021. The Mavericks have a chance at redemption here. Just like Jordan had to go through the Bulls, just like LeBron, albeit by team hopping, had to go through the Celtics, you now have Luka having to go through the Clippers. You love to see it, especially when you think the odds are for once in your favor. I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but I think it's going to actually be doable this time around. He doesn't have to do everything. So... Going through this here, I wanted to look at some things, not just the surface level, although don't worry, we'll talk surface level. I also wanted to look at more recent trends, post-trade deadline and the last 10 games, see how these two teams compare there. I wanted to talk about significant health status updates of certain players, certain key players, I might say, as well as X factors in this series to watch for. All that's coming up here after the bumper. Boom. All right, now let's get into it here. What are some of these surface level things we can look at? The obvious things people always consider, who are your points per game leaders? Who are the key scorers of the basketball for us to focus on in this series? For the Mavericks, you got the obvious, Luka Doncic at 33.9 points per game. Kyrie Irving then comes in at 25.6. To the surprise of maybe some, Tim Hardaway Jr. still is your third leading scorer at 14.4 per game. Although some people would rather think of P.J. Washington perhaps as your true third option. Now, P.J.'s office, offense has not been stellar since coming to the Mavericks, been, shall we say, inconsistent. But his rebounding and his defense and his impact has gone well beyond just scoring. For what it's worth, P.J. is your fourth leading scorer, clocking in at 11.7. And then you got the big man, Daniel Gafford, at 11.2 points per game. Now, for the Clippers... You're gonna, you might notice something. I'll, I'll, I'll circle around to it if you don't. But for the Clippers, you got Kawhi Leonard at 23.7 points per game. After that, you got Paul George at 22.6. I'll just say it. I love the balance there, that they're basically within one point of each other. 1.1 points, whatever. Uh, great balance between your one and two. Then you got James Harden at 16.6. Norman Powell at 13.9. Zubats at 11.7, and coming off the bench, at least for most of the year, Russell Westbrook at 11.1. You might have noticed I went with six entries for the Clippers versus five for the Mavericks. That's because I was looking at double-digit scores, son. If we want to talk about other guys, we can talk about other guys, but I just wanted to keep it at the surface level, what the casual fans might look for. Those are your significant double-digit scorers in a series based on regular season averages. Moving on. Now, if you're interested, the Clippers did win the season series against the Mavericks 2-1. Okay. The thing to note, the last time they played was December 20th. Yes, we're talking pre-trade deadline, pre-Christmas day. And why is that significant? Because the Mavericks in December and January were decimated with injuries. They were without considerable help. And so these two versions of these teams have not matched up. It's not as simple as saying like, hey, this is a different team than 2020 or 2021. Sure, you could say that about either team, obviously. However, this particular version of the Mavericks and this version of the Clippers haven't even seen each other. So you can almost throw out these games entirely, but we'll talk about that last matchup a little bit here, just to give you some context. The Clippers did win that one comfortably, although for some reason in my notes, I don't have that exact score in front of me. But here's what I'm going to point out. In that game, Kawhi Leonard scored 30 points, grabbed 10 boards. Luka, light lifting day for him, 28 points, 10 assists, 9 rebounds. The difference? Luka was only 9 of 25 from the field. 
for a guy that has basically beat up on the Clippers more than anybody else in his career. You look at especially his playoff averages against them, mind-boggling stuff. This was a bad game for him. Maybe that's Luka standards, but at the very least it wasn't efficient. And, you know, when you look at the help he had, you might kind of understand it a little bit, especially, again, with how decimated they were at the time, what he was having to do night in, night out, trying to hold the team's head above water and stay afloat. In that game, the Mavericks started Grant Williams, Derek Jones Jr., Dwight Powell, who thankfully does not really play anymore, uh, Luca, and Dante Exum. Now, I love me some Dante Exum, but that's not a strong starting lineup. No, no disrespect to, to Exum there or Derek Jones Jr. for what it's worth. But uh, that's definitely, definitely not your ideal lineup to have to run out there. Now, the Clippers, conversely, I'll, I'll grant, they only played eight men, so a very shallow bench. But they got Kawhi Leonard, Zubats, Harden, Trey Mann, and Coffey. Basically, their normal lineup. To say these things, one of these things is not like the other, a bit of an understatement. So you really can set that game aside entirely in my mind. This is basically a clean slate. Let's see which of these teams is better. Now, to understand what's better, I thought maybe we should look at some trends. I'm going to wait for that annoying helicopter to fade into the distance. Okay. So to get an understanding of which team is better, I decided the best thing we can do is look at these two teams post-trade deadline, right? Like when they locked in, the Clippers, their roster and our roster were locked in. Let's see how they were. Let's look at a sample size of at least 30 games. Who was better? Who performed better? Of course, there's extenuating circumstances in any of these conversations. We'll get into that, but let's dive in. Post All-Star break, the Mavericks went 21 and 9. That is 30 games. The Clippers, meanwhile, went 17 and 15. That's 32 games, but barely above 500. That's significant. The Clippers were a much better team in the first half of the year. And, you know, I understand you're going to have some injuries, some wear and tear here and there, some rest games, especially when you got Kawhi and older players on their team like they do with Harden and Westbrook and even Paul George. I get it. But at the same time, they were a much better team record-wise in the first half than they were the second half. That is indisputable. Undisputable, indisputable. Undisputable. Maybe both work. I don't know. Moving on. So let's take a look then at how they fared specifically. Not just the outcome of those games, let's see how the team did in certain key stats. Well, the Mavericks post-trade deadline are fourth in rebounding, eighth in points in the paint, and fifth fewest when it comes to allowing points in the paint. So they're scoring in the top 10 in the league when it comes to just getting points in the paint, high efficiency, high percentage field goal attempts, and flipping that, they're allowing <laughs> the fifth fewest points in the paint. Mm. And, and rebounding top five as well. Mm. Why is that significant? Why does that sound significant? Oh, let's talk about that. In game three, after game three, I should say, of the 2021 playoff series with the Clippers, Paul George was asked about him being more aggressive in creating penetration into the paint to open up the offense for the Clippers. He, as I say this, I don't know if I can say famously said, but he accurately at the time, I'll grant, pointed out the Mavericks had no rim protection. Oh, how things have changed, you sweet summer child. The Mavericks now are a completely different team. The front court of Daniel Gafford and, you know, coming off the bench then, Derek Lively, we'll talk about that in a little bit, uh, is just stacked for the Mavericks. It's probably the best one-two punch at the center position in the league, not just for the interior defense, not just for the shot-blocking ability and the rebounding, but also just the key athleticism and the pick-and-roll threat, the lob threat, my goodness, the lob threat. And the fact that you got both Luka and Kyrie and even other key players that can just throw lobs to them all night long, it is a long night for you. That's a big part of Daniel Gafford leading the league in field goal percentage this season with, I believe, the third or fourth highest field goal percentage for a regular season ever. It's because, yeah, yeah, he's getting a lot of dunks, yes. 
but he's also making a lot of tough baskets, whether it's a drop step into a baby hook, whether it's a falling backwards on his head against, I think it was Charlotte. No, not Charlotte. It was Miami in that game. Whatever you want to look at, the dude is doing work. And a lot of that comes from the fact that he's able to be spoon fed by superstars who know what his spots are, how to get him there, and how to feed him in a moment's notice when that opportunity presents itself. So yeah, Paul George, this might be a good, good run of comeuppance for you here. While you might have felt that you were on vacation traveling into the paint against our previous front courts, I think this is going to be your karmic moment here. You're kind of welcome to reality because this is going to be a very different experience for you. I feel pretty confident in saying that. So let's take a look at the Clippers meanwhile. How did they do post-trade deadline? Well, they were 22nd in rebounding, so that's bad. They had 17th, they ranked 17th in points in the paint themselves, bottom half of the league, and their opponent's points in the paint made them good for tied 19th. So again, bad. Bottom half of the league, both in points scored in the paint and allowed in the paint, and even worse than that, 22nd when it comes to rebounding. That's not good. That's not a good trend. Again, this is over the course of 32 games. Even if you want to drop out those last two games for them, because similar to the Mavericks, they didn't really have much they were playing for there at the end. They were kind of locked in where they were locked in after at least the second to last game when the Mavericks lost that first one to Detroit. There was no more threat. They were locked in at the 4-5 matchup. But even still, a big factor there worth considering. Let's look more zeroed in than that. If, if 30 and 32 games is too big of a sample size for you, if you think that maybe there's a micro trend emerging that we should be focusing on, how did these teams do in their last, say, 10 games? Okay, sure. I hear you, fam. The Mavericks went 7-3 and three in their final 10 with losses to OKC and Detroit and Golden State. Now, the OKC and Detroit losses didn't matter. You could technically say the Detroit loss meant, hey, you can't possibly move up to the four seed. You've locked in at the five. True. But at the same time, they rested Luka and Kyrie those final two games. They, they weren't trying to win. Not that they were, you know, throwing games. They would have taken a win if their, if their bench guys, if their reserves could power them to a win. They didn't. But they would have accepted those. The fact is the Mavericks didn't really try for those last two games. So they went 7-3 and three in their final 10. Their wins, meanwhile, were against Sacramento, Houston twice, Atlanta, Golden State, Charlotte, and Miami. That's a good resume. Houston, yeah, you bounced them out of the playoffs, but you ended an 11-game win streak, and then you effectively ended their season and their play-in hopes in the rematch. That's two quality wins there. Golden State, you got them back. They ended a nice little win streak of yours. You got them back in the rematch and basically at the time spoiled their chance that night to clinch a spot in the play-in. Significant. Um, Miami, great win. Not just that it's your 50th win of the year, but it's also the game that forced Miami into this play-in situation and has put them kind of in a difficult spot. They did not want that spot. They were there last year, I realize but not really their ideal position to be, especially now, looking at it now, with the, the playing games last night, Jimmy Butler. Uh, well, that, that, that's a whole different thing. So I like those wins there for you. And then, you know, Charlotte, Atlanta, that, hold, handling your business. The Sacramento win was really nice, and especially because if you look a little bit longer of a, a window than 10 games, then you see, like, they got Sacramento twice and back-to-back, -back, and both of those were key in helping Dallas jump up the rankings. Now let's look at the Clippers. What did they do in their final 10? Well, they went 6-4 and four with losses to Sacramento, key because, as I just said, the Mavericks beat them twice back-to-back, -back. Uh, Phoenix, Utah, and Houston. Eh. Now their wins came against Phoenix, Cleveland, Utah, Denver, Orlando, and Charlotte. Those wins against Cleveland and Denver are strong. I'm not going to lie. But the rest of that I kind of feel eh about in their final 10. Again, this team a little shaky down the stretch. It's final 30 games, barely playing 500 basketball. But, you know, it is what it is. The fact that they beat the Suns in a game where they didn't have Paul George or Kawhi Leonard or Paul George, or was it James Harden that was out instead? I forget. The point being... They beat Phoenix in a game where they were almost hilariously 
underpowered at the time, missing key players, and the Suns just being the Suns just est the bed. So now let's talk about key injuries here. What has a potential to, pl uh, a potential to impact this series? Well, for the Clippers, Kawhi Leonard has not played since March 29th in a 197 win over the Magic. In that game, he did have 29 points for what it's worth. He's reportedly still dealing with excess of swelling in the right knee, but recent footage from practice shows him looking all right. I mean, to be fair, it's not like he was running, cutting, jumping, shooting, anything like that. He was kind of just doing like I'm doing now, just standing, gently swaying a little bit, but you know, you know, a little bit of, a little bit of lubricating of that knee there as you're swaying, your, your legs having to work a little bit. So I expect him to play game one, but if I'm Dallas, I really take a close look at that. I, I attack him. I, I understand his reputation as a stopper, the claw, all that. I go after him, not just because I have the dogs that I think can go at him and find success. Like you talk about like, yeah, the, the defensive presence of Paul George and Kawhi Leonard and their reputations. I get it, but you also have not one, but two of the highest degree of difficulty shot makers in the league. So you are already going to be testing them a little bit, but now I'm probably going at him and I'm attacking that right leg, trying to make him push off, trying to make him go lateral, trying to make him just have to navigate screens as much as possible because, yeah, he might feel fine quarter one. He might feel fine game one. But as you roll into game two, game three, if that knee is not 100%, you might start to see some cracks forming. You might see him slowing down. You might see him being less explosive. You might see him, dare I say, limping around a little bit. Like, you could present yourself an opportunity, and that's just smelling blood in the water and going for the throat. That's, that's all that is. Now, conversely, if the knee is close to 100% and it's really not showing any signs, and of course the Mavericks have not just the, the advanced film sessions and all of that, not just the analytics, they're going to be able to study and understand like, hey, okay, here we are now with a, a somewhat decent sample size. Is he impacted at all by that knee? Is he limited as this game, as this series progresses here? If not, if he really is close to 100% and he's not showing signs of slowing down, you need to adjust your strategy just a little bit there. But early on, I think you have to go for it. The guy hasn't played in 23 days. Now, that's a lot of rest, more than three weeks, but that's a sizable stretch to miss in a, in a you know, regular season. There might be some rust. There might be a little bit of stiffness in that knee, just kind of getting back going. I try it. I try it. I test it. I see where he's at. Now, you also have James Harden dealing with a foot ailment. I, I'm less, you know, less aware of that one in the, the real depth of it. It's probably something minor, probably something he'll play through and generally look fine with his role being, you know, he's their third leading scorer, but he's, again, third in the pecking order. He's going to kind of control things a little bit and defer to Kawhi, defer to Paul George to an extent and just kind of work within his role. And so I think he'll be able to cover that up a little bit better, unless he feels good in a particular game, in which case he might try to assert himself a little bit more. Now for the Mavericks, yeah, I mentioned earlier, Luka and Kyrie rested the final 10 days, the final two games over the stretch of 10 days now between the, the last game they played in that win against Miami that netted Kyrie a cool million dollar bonus and netted the Mavericks their 50th and final regular season win and Sunday's game one. That's a good period of rest for them. That's a benefit Luka has not really been able to enjoy previously because even in the 2022 run, I can't remember if it was the last regular season game, but it was a game that was basically decided against the Spurs and he had like a high ankle sprain and then he missed the first two games against the Jazz. Unfortunately, Jalen Brunson's coming out party allowed Dallas to take both of those games and really, really put the pressure on Utah uh, for when Luka came back then just completely shutting down a Jazz team that thought they were a contender and instead found themselves headed into a rebuild. So, nice. Giving Luka 10 days of rest before the playoffs, that's nice, especially for how he was looking in that Miami game. He looked a little bit labored, a little bit gimpy with the, the wear and tear and exhaustion of the season. That's understandable, but getting him that rest and getting Kyrie that rest. Kyrie had played in like 30 or 35 consecutive games since coming back from his heel injury, I believe it was, or maybe it was another little one there, a thumb or something. But he had played a long stretch as well, so getting both of them rest was essential. Now, for the Mavericks, the only other thing of note on the injury report that I'm really looking at is Derek Lively. 
He did miss the last, I want to say, eight games of the regular season because he was not 100%. He had a mild sprain of the knee, and that is something to watch, especially for an athletic player, a guy that likes to sky for rebounds, sky for shot blocks, sky for alley-oops, you know, all of that. But getting those final eight games and the most recent reports that I've heard from kids suggest like, yeah, you know, we'll see. He, he's looking better, but we'll see how he's going game one. I would expect he plays game one. Now, I do think his minutes will be a little bit more limited. So it's not going to be just total like, all right, go out there, do your thing, you're back. I think Dallas is going to try to ease him in just a little bit. But as long as Gafford can stay out of foul trouble, I do think that he'll be all right. I think that with the overall interior defense of the Mavericks, with their overall rebounding acumen, they're not going to have to lean too heavily on Derek Lively. Because if you remember this team before the acquisition of Daniel Gafford, if Lively missed the game, the Mavericks were sunk. If he played, they at least had a shot because they could actually defend in the paint. They could actually rebound, aside from, you know, Luka. Now that you have P.J. Washington and Daniel Gafford and other guys stepping up too, the overall defense and rebounding is better. So you don't have as dire and desperate of a need for Derek Lively. If he's not completely ready, I think you can ease him in. If he does miss game one, then, you know, we'll see. That could be a factor in the outcome of that game. But I think Everything points to him being good to go, good to return here soon. And if he's playing, then you know what? I feel extra, extra confident in the Mavericks' chances. Let's talk now about some X-Factors. Because you know you're dealing with the X-Factor. The Mavericks, I'm going to give you an interesting one. I referenced him earlier. I'm going with my dude, Dante's Inferno. Dante Exum. Why am I going with Exum? Not just for the fact that he's had multiple big cojones clutch buckets, game winners, overtime forcers in the latter half of this season, but also because there is, there is uh, context to this. There is precedence for this point, for this choice that I'm making. I don't know who I'm gesturing to. I just don't like seeing that I'm stationary on the camera, and so I'm trying to include a little bit of movement here. Dante Exum in the 2018 playoffs did a really good job on James Harden. This was back when Dante was on the Jazz and he gave Harden some fits. He made life difficult. I'm not gonna say shut him down, but he played some damn good defense on James Harden. Now Harden being a step slower, I, th I think that's fair to say at this point, right? We're talking about James Harden in 2024, certainly not the same as he was height of his powers Houston, uh, around that 2016 to 2019, or 18, let's say, window. Very different James Harden than what we got now. So the fact that Dante's going against him, and Dante's had this kind of career renaissance here with the Mavericks, I do think you could see a similar impact on the horizon. For the regular season, uh, excuse me, for the matchups against the Clippers this year, the three games, one of which at least he started, Dante averaged 8.7 points, three boards, and shot 37.5% from three. Nice. To put that in context of his overall season, he averaged 7.8 points, 2.7 boards, 2.9 assists, and shot, for some reason I took down the field goal percentage and not the three-point percentage to compare apples to apples, but overall his field goal percentage this year was 53.3%. Again, multiple game-winning threes and clutch shots in the latter stage of the season. He is probably the Mavericks' third most clutch shooter uh, as time is winding down in those big moments. So make it that what you will. He's a guy that even if he misses a key opportunity for a bucket on one possession, stays at it on the defensive end, either secures a huge rebound, blocks a shot, gets a steal, or then goes the other way and just splashes the three. He is very good with that short-term memory and erasing whatever mistake or missed opportunity he just had. And I think that could be key here. Also, when you consider the fact that the Mavericks love them a three-guard lineup, uh, you look at the idea of him and Luka and Kyrie. Dude, it's, it's a small sample size, only 390 possessions, but it's straight up nasty. The net rating for the Mavericks with that three-guard lineup is plus 23.9 points, an offensive rating of 132.6, a defensive rating of 108.6. Good God, that is serious business here. Again, small sample size, but when you consider the fact that the Mavericks in their 2022 march to the West Finals really 
had that bread and butter with the Luka, Jalen, Spencer, Dinwiddie three-guard lineup. I like it. I, I think there's – not only because Exum is a better defender than uh, Dinwiddie, but also just the fact that, like, Dinwiddie will go hero ball on you. He will be a little bit of a Tim Hardaway type. So when you got both those guys and they're both trying to play that role, it can be a little bit of a challenge. Dante understands his role. He's not going to – you don't have to draw things up for him. You don't have to force the issue. He's going to pick and choose his spots. And more often than not, he plays to that very well, and he delivers when asked to. All right, so now let's talk about the Clippers X Factor. If you watched my stream earlier in the week, you probably already know where I'm going with this. Maybe you can look at this and say my secondary ties to Oklahoma City being from that area, uh, being in attendance for the first ever game in Oklahoma City, the first ever, well, Thunder game in Oklahoma City, and that first ever Western Conference Finals game against the Mavericks. You could say that. To be clear, I was wearing a Dirk jersey in a sea of Durants and Westbrooks and Hardens. True story. I stayed true to Dallas. Don't, don't get it twisted. Don't question it. I'm looking at Russell Westbrook. Why am I looking at Russell Westbrook? I guess that is worth clarifying because the Clippers have like three former Thunder players on it now. But uh, I'm looking at Russell Westbrook despite the disrespect that Russell gets. I understand his shortcomings and his deficiencies, especially at this stage in his career. Against the Mavericks this year, Russell averaged 12.7 points, 4 assists, shot 55.2% from the field. I'm not even going to talk about his three-point percentage because I think it was literally goose egg. The point... Oh, and to give context to that, his regular season averages, again, 11.1 points, 5 boards, 4.5 assists, 45.4% from the field. So he played better, smaller sample size, of course, against the Mavericks than he did overall. I get that. There's also something worth saying that even though he's not an efficient shooter, what he brings is not limited to just the scoring aspect. Russell Westbrook brings passion, heart, fire, and a relentless, unstoppable motor to the table. That's why when he switched to coming off the bench, he found a late career resurgence. Because, yeah, when, when we looked at how things went with him in Lakerland, it looked like nobody would ever deal with him again. Like, he was cooked, he was done, his career was over. He ex instead uh, accepts the limited role coming off the bench, being the the backup floor general, and just allowing his energy and spark plug nature to pick and choose his spots by not trying to be everything or even being a top three every night guy, one of the big three. He kind of found a nice role for himself where he can let his hustle, whether it's skying for a rebound in a crowd, whether it's diving for a loose ball, whether it's locking a guy up and getting a steal, screaming and beating his chest, whether it's flashbacks to when he could sky through the air and tomahawk dunk on a dude in transition, whatever the case may be, his actual points might not be significant, but the energy and the fire he brings does inject life into his teammates. It does help turn the momentum of a game. You want to look at something, you can look at, I think it might have been that game three against the Mavericks in 2021, that transition dunk where Kawhi dunks on Maxi Kleba in transition, and you get that shot that Clipper fans feel is iconic. I always look at it and say, like, I know they won the series, but they lost that game. So it's weird to me that they're hyping up this photo from a game they lost. But you get, I think it was DeMarcus Cousins, Kawhi Leonard, and Paul George, all three standing over Maxi while he's on the ground and just screaming. And it's an intense photo. It is. That is the sort of thing that Russell brings to the table. I'm not saying he's going to tomahawk dunk on a dude in transition, although I still think he's capable. I'm saying that that fire, that energy, is absolutely there. Russell's relentlessness and no-quit attitude is one of the reasons why, even as he has suffered slander after slander throughout these later parts of his career, post-Thunder, post-Rockets even, why I've always still held an appreciation for him. Now, at his salary cap figure, I have not wanted him on the Mavericks, but that's a different conversation. I still respect the dude, and I think he can absolutely be a guy that just helps change the tone and the energy of a game or of a series overall if you're not careful. So that's And, and as well, he's someone to keep in context because 
as far as guys go having to deal with Luka, whether it's guarding him, whether it's going at him on the other end, Russell's actually fared pretty well. I'm not going to say that like he shuts him down or that he embarrasses Luka on the other end. I know Clipper fans are looking at a game from earlier this year where he you know, was effective in his time against Luka. But again, I set out those two games, those, or those three games. It's, it's a completely different picture now than what you had then. You can't compare the two. But if you go all the way back even to that exhibition game, that preseason game that was MVP still Westbrook on the Thunder dealing with 15, 16-year-old Luka on Real Madrid, like, they've, he, he's handled, he's handled him a bit. Like, by no means has he been just destroyed by Luka or struggled with that. He's fared about as well as anybody could. So that's also something to consider. They're probably going to find and seek out these tough matchups, even if they're in limited doses, and Westbrook has had some success going at Luka. So worth noting. So let's get in now to my final prediction here. Who wins this series and why? If it's not already obvious from my initial statement uh, about delayed redemption, if it's not obvious about how I've talked about this matchup and the trends and the health picture and all of that, I think this is Dallas's series. I think Dallas takes this series four games to two. I could see this being a five-game gentleman sweep, but I really do think that if Kawhi is at all Kawhi, if the heart of the Terminator is still beating, I, I realize it's a cyborg and so that's a strange statement I just made, uh, then I think that they have the potential to steal a game from out, out from under Dallas that Dallas may be in position to win and kind of thinking to themselves like, ah, we let that one get away. And in the past, that might have been a really detrimental thing to them. I'm looking at you, Game 6 from 2021. No excuses! No excuses. Or was it game five that they were up huge and then gave it all away? Regardless, I look at this and I say, the Mavericks, you know, excluding uh, the final two games without Luka and Kyrie, the Mavericks were 8.4 points better per 100 possessions than the Clippers. Again, comparing head-to-head -head data, looking over um, the stretch post-trade deadline. So post-trade deadline, 8.4 points better per 100 possession as long as Luka and Kyrie were in the lineup. That's good for the second best mark in the league, by the way. So giving further context to just how effective that is. Before it, uh, as in when teams actually faced off against each other, the Clippers and Mavericks faced off, Dallas was 17th in that net rating picture. So their defense went from 22nd pre-trade deadline to 5th post-trade deadline. These two teams are not the same. Dallas, excluding those final two games, was 16-2 and two in the, down the stretch of the season when they were actually going for it and trying to win. They were outscoring opponents by 15.5 points per 100 possessions. 15.5 points per 100 possessions. That's the fourth best mark in the league when you consider lineups that played at least 100 minutes together post-trade deadline. Like, they are... They are on a hot streak right now. And the thing is, like, when you're looking at a sample size of 30 games, it's not even that. And truly, they were starting to roll even before the deadline. They won, like, their last two or three games before the deadline um, in, in that respect. So, or maybe that was before the All-Star break. I forget. Point being, Dallas was already starting to find something. Then you got a sample size of, you know, again, starting to approach half point of the season how they, have, how they have shot up the standings, how the Clippers have sagged back. And I know if you look at some data, you can say like, well, usually how a team fared early on in the year is more indicative of the outcome of a game versus how they fared down the stretch. That's to say the team that was better for most of the year, usually in the playoffs, will still beat the team that got hot late. 30 games is not a small sample size. I don't view that as getting hot. I view that as... You found what works, and now you have enough data to suggest that like this just is the, the state of your team. This is the standard production of your team. So I look at this and I say the Mavericks have been the better team, not just down the stretch. They have been the better team in just about every category you can look at. When you look at the high water marks of the Clippers versus the Mavericks, when you actually have their relevant lineups and teams to compare head-to-head, -head, 
rosters to compare head to head, I should say. It, it's it's not a it's not a conversation. I'm giving respect to the Clippers in saying that I think that even James Harden at this stage in his career, Russell Westbrook at this stage in his career, Kawhi Leonard, Paul George, I'm still saying I think they can still steal a game or two from you if you are not on your A game. The thing is, more often than not, Dallas doesn't have to be on its A game to win these games. Dallas, as much as Dallas used to live and die by the three, if they shot the three well, that was when they won games, or at least usually won games. And if they shot poorly, it was basically just chalk it up. This is going to be a loss. That's not the case anymore. When we're talking about those final 30 games, even those final 18 games where they were really going for it, you look at it and you say, this team is shooting at times less than 35% from three, maybe even less than 32% from three, and still winning. Why? Because of its defense, because of its rebounding. It had a complete identity change mid-season, and aside from a week, week and a half, where it had to kind of recalibrate and kick off, I was going to say rust, but that would imply that they had the streak before, the rhythm before, just get attuned to it. Aside from that stretch, they have been unquestionably one of the best teams in the league. If they were in the Eastern Conference, they would be the two seed. The Mavericks are the sixth best record in the NBA. And how they closed the season post-deadline should get a lot of people's attention because the disrespect is what they're looking at when they're comparing where this team was to start the year. The disrespect is when they're looking at last year, post-trade deadline, when you acquired Kyrie and they're saying, yeah, this Mavericks team is a bunch of bums. Dude, the Luka-Kyrie combination this year is so much better. Even in the one cherry-picked metric they wanted to look at last year, saying like, oh, games where Luka and Kyrie played together, their record was only this. Mm, not very effective, huh? Compare that to this year. Look at the same data this year. They are light years better. To say that they can't work together or that they don't work together is just, it's a fallacy. Like, it's lazy analysis. This team is stacked. They might not have as many big names as the Clippers, but when you look at the fact that those Clippers, a lot of those guys are kind of into that latter portion of their career, I would say that it's, the table is more level than you give credit for. And I'm going to look at this and I'm going to say the team that is top 10 in offense and defense, the team that is playing hot, the team that is generally healthy, knock on wood, is the team that I'm going to bet on in a postseason matchup. Anything else? No? Yeah, if the Clippers, Clippers have more miles on the tires, the Clippers are more banged up. Again, if Kawhi's knee isn't exactly where it needs to be, if he's not close to 100%, then I think a war of attrition is going to favor Dallas. And for that reason, I got Mavericks with respect in six. But that's my time for today. Thank you so much for watching. If you haven't already, like the video, subscribe to the Dallas Prospect. And until next time, guys, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace! From Prospect to Legend!